United States gained its nationhood more than 150 years ago, pride of the American people has been the U.S. Navy. As officer, blue jacket, or marine, you are a member of a great and proud body of fighting men, inheritors of many glorious traditions, the first of which is victory. Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy is the President of the United States, whose authority is derived directly from the Constitution. Under the Chief Executive is the Department of the Navy, which embraces all naval activities ashore and afloat, at home and abroad. At the head of the Navy Department is a civilian, the Secretary of the Navy, who is a member of the President's Cabinet. The Secretary's advisors and administrators include the Assistant and Under Secretaries, civilians, together with the officer chiefs of the department's seven bureaus. Ranking officer of the Navy today is Cominch Admiral Ernest J. King, who holds the dual title of Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Fleet and Chief of Naval Operations. Of the seven bureaus in the Navy Department, the one with which you are probably most directly concerned is the Bureau of Personnel, whose former name was the Bureau of Navigation. The Bureau of Personnel's many activities include recruiting and transportation, training, discipline and welfare, and the assignment to duty of all commissioned and warrant officers and enlisted men. Commissioned officers are appointed by the President with the advice and consent of the Senate. In time of war, the ranks of officer personnel are augmented by thousands of naval reserves. From the nation's colleges, universities, and technical schools, and from among its own enlisted personnel, the Navy draws officer material. Officer training, like recruit training, is compressed and condensed into the shortest possible period of time. Candidates for either deck or engineering duties must master on shore the basic essentials of their seagoing profession. Because the Navy must command the air over the seas in which it is fighting, thousands of young Americans are being trained to become officers in the Naval Air Force. Especially qualified, physically and mentally, these young men must master in concentrated weeks what formerly took months at ground and flying school. Upon graduation, the aviation cadet is commissioned an ensign in the U.S. Naval Reserve. To provide officers for the greatest sea and air armada the world has ever known, Naval Reserve midshipmen, as well as Navy regulars, are being trained at Annapolis. For all of its 167 years, the Navy has recruited its enlisted personnel entirely from volunteers, men who have applied for service in the Navy of their own choice and free will. Every man who is accepted by the Navy is expected to bring with him the qualities which make a good blue jacket. Courage, obedience, devotion to duty, ambition, and a sense of responsibility and leadership. Time and again, upon the initiative and intelligence of the individual blue jacket, has depended the fate of a ship, the lives of shipmates, even the outcome of battle. men in the Navy are required to wear the correct uniform. The naval uniform with its various insignia and devices is designed primarily to indicate on site those belonging to the naval service, their rating and the degree of their authority and responsibility. It should be a matter of pride with every blue jacket to be habitually, neatly and smartly dressed and to see that his uniforms are scrupulously clean. Those who are properly and smartly dressed create a far better impression than those who are careless and slovenly. 
bag inspection is held frequently to see that your clothes are clean, tidy, and properly marked, and that your clothing outfit is complete. To pass a good bag inspection is one of the first things a sailor must learn to do. You must bear in mind that your country is at war, and that your navy must win that war. For what you have to learn, there is all too little time. Naval training is for the sole purpose of making you a useful man and a leader of men. In the Navy, your progress depends entirely upon you, the quality of your work, your study, and your effort. The hardest workers among you will become petty officers and chief petty officers, and men with exceptional qualifications may become warrant officers and commissioned officers. Accurate knowledge is necessary if you are to succeed in your work. Without accurate knowledge, you waste time and bungle the job. Nothing can be more dangerous than carelessness, for in battle there is no time to correct mistakes. A competent blue jacket learns all there is to know about his special duties, but he never forgets that first of all he is a fighting man whose military responsibility comes before everything else. Along with your first taste of salt water, you will get a graphic and simple illustration of the teamwork, which is the basic necessity of every fighting force. A coxswain or boat officer is in command. His authority is, for the moment, absolute. Unless his commands are promptly obeyed, the boat makes no headway. But when every man in the crew does what he is supposed to do, the boat surges ahead. The recruit in the Navy may find his first few weeks the hardest time of all. His only contact with the life he has left behind in this difficult time of change and adjustment is most probably by mail. The best cure for loneliness and even homesickness can be the letter to home and from home. To help the new sailor through the first period of confusion among strange surroundings, the Navy endeavors to make this new life lose some of its strangeness. Throughout all your naval career, you will constantly be meeting new faces and making new friends. They will judge you as you will judge them, by your loyalty to them as shipmates. They will judge you by your cheerfulness, your sportsmanship, and your honesty. Today, with so many new ships being commissioned, a recruit may leave the training station for sea duty a few weeks after entering the service. Aboard whatever ship he may be sent to, he will have the opportunity to make use of what he has already learned, and he will continue the process of learning by doing. From now on, the new sailor's home and school will be the sea. Since the days when the sailing ship gave way to the modern man of war, the Navy's need of specially trained and skilled men has been growing year by year. Until today, nearly every man in the service is a specialist in one field or another. Out of every class of recruits, there are some who, instead of going straight to sea, will first enter one of the Navy's service schools. These schools are designed to give such instruction to recruits as will make them more immediately useful at sea and give them the groundwork necessary for the lowest petty officer ratings. The Navy wants trained men. It wants to help those who want to get ahead. And it is always glad to give a higher rating and higher pay for men with special skills. To such men, the Navy offers a career in peacetime, as well as the opportunity to serve their country during war. To men who qualify, the Navy provides sound training in practically every trade. For those who study and work, there is always the opportunity to move up to higher grades, whether you go directly from the training station to service school or are sent to school after you've been at sea. You have been picked because your record has been good and your petty officers believe you have definite aptitude for the work to be taken up. A great many of the men who have won success in the Navy owe it to the fact that they decided early in their careers in what work they wanted to specialize. 
Application and industry in any of the Navy's 60-odd fields of specialization cannot fail to win for the intelligent man early and rapid promotion to chief petty officer and often beyond. Every development in the science of warfare opens up new ratings for Navy specialists. The emergence of air power as a necessary adjunct to sea power alone created the need for a whole new class of experts, the aviation specialist. Like the Navy's other service schools, its aviation training courses offer great and varied opportunities, both in peace and in war. The hallmark of a good blue jacket, whether he is rated or non-rated, is his military bearing and smartness. No matter what his length of service may be, or what his rating is, every recruit, every enlisted man has certain duties of a military nature quite apart from his special and technical duties. You may sometimes wonder why it is necessary to spend time on drilling. The answer is discipline. In the Navy, discipline is necessary for success in battle and the only object of the Navy is to win battles. One of the most memorable events in a sailor's life comes on the day he reports for duty aboard his first ship. You will probably never forget the thrill and pride that comes with saluting the quarterdeck of the ship, which from now on is to be your home. From now on you will be a part of it, and it will be a part of you. You will soon discover the meaning of the word ship shape. Space is limited and everything must be neatly stowed to take up as little room as possible. Every man aboard ship has a specific station and definite duties under routine conditions and in emergencies. Officers who fly a four-star flag are full admirals. Junior to them are the other flag officers, vice admirals and rear admirals. Flag officers may command a fleet or any one of its component parts. Under these, in turn, are the commanding officers of the individual ships. The line officer ordered to command a ship, regardless of his rank, is called captain. Aboard ship, the captain is supreme. The officer of the deck is the officer on watch in charge of the ship. He acts as the captain's representative, and all on board except the executive officer are subject to his orders. The line officer next in seniority to the captain is the executive officer. He is the ship's administrator who coordinates the work of department heads and carries out the captain's policies. From the exec, the chain of command extends on down through department heads to division officers, chief petty officers and petty officers. Every ship in the Navy follows a general routine which has been evolved from many years' experience. This routine may be modified or added to by the captain to suit special conditions. When provisions for the general mess or the ship's store are taken aboard, Navy regulations require that they be inspected by an officer of the supply corps for quantity and by a medical officer for quality. When fueling ship or taking aboard ammunition, the smoking lamp is out. That means no smoking for all hands. All unauthorized lights and fires must be extinguished while magazines are open and ammunition is on deck. Shells have distinctive colors or markings which indicate the type of shell and the kind of bursting charge. In airtight metal tanks are bags of smokeless powder. When a ship of the Navy gets underway, the routine must change. The officer of the deck moves up from the quarter deck to stand his watch on the bridge. When underway in company with other ships, the ship of the senior officer present becomes the flagship and signals the formation, course, and speed. Though the flagship may designate the course and speed, the captain and navigator of each ship are individually responsible for the safety of their ship. Orders to the helmsman follow a prescribed form and like orders to the engine room and fire room are repeated back to make sure that they have been correctly understood. All commands given which affect course or speed are entered in the ship's log, together with the time they were given and the time they were executed. 
to form a permanent record of the ship's movements. Even though a man stands regular sea watches, he must also continue to take his full part in the ship's routine. Aboard larger naval vessels, when weather permits, quarters for muster is followed by setting up exercises. Though these are disliked by some men, they help compensate for the inactivity occasioned by the restricted space aboard ship. The Marine Detachment often uses this period for polishing up the manual of arms. Under ordinary peacetime conditions, days at sea away from the busy port routine provide opportunities to catch up on the thousand and one odd jobs which must be done. Neatness and trimness in the smallest details are the mark of a smart ship and a good crew. The smartness of a ship is that intangible quality, readily recognized, which is the sum total of the alertness, the efficiency, the attention to detail, and the self-respect of every officer and blue jacket aboard. Even the manner in which a ship transmits and receives its signals is generally an indication of the character of the ship itself and of its crew. A ship whose signal bridge functions with speed and accuracy is likely to be an efficient ship. Nowhere are speed, precision, and smartness so vitally important and so clearly evident as aboard an aircraft carrier. And no ship in the whole Navy is so completely dependent upon the competence and level-headed judgment of the individual. Pilots, man your planes. Aboard the carrier, every officer and every blue jacket is an important player on one great team. When the carrier's crew is called into action, there is no room for error, no time to ask questions. A moment of indecision or confusion can cost a victory. Speed in launching planes from a carrier, no less than accuracy and rapidity of fire in turret guns, is a determining factor in battle and can only be attained by long practice, absolute discipline, and perfect coordination. It is not heavy armament and massed firepower alone that makes a Navy great, but the combination of these with loyal and intelligent manpower. A ship which prides itself on its smartness and all-around efficiency is invariably a happy ship. A contented crew makes for an efficient ship, and good officers habitually show every consideration for the men who serve with them. In the United States Navy, the enlisted men have more comforts and conveniences than in any other Navy in the world. In providing recreational facilities for its men, the Navy long ago found that the Blue Jacket was representative of normal, educated American youth, that his taste was the taste of intelligent young men everywhere. Motion pictures, which formerly were used aboard ship only for entertainment, are now an important and effective medium of training and indoctrination. One thing we must never do is to underestimate the enemy. The Japanese have been most successful in copying and applying modern ideas of warfare. They are shrewd and resourceful fighters, and they have shown themselves to be absolutely ruthless. Day and night, as long as you're in the Navy, you will be working and living in the company of hundreds of others with whom you will share living space, food, and recreation. What you make of your naval career may well depend upon your ability to get along with your shipmates, to respect the rights of others, and to extend to them the understanding and consideration which make for goodwill and friendliness. To all hands, from the admiral to the newest seaman, a ship represents not only his home, but his community. And within it are contained all the varied elements of a community ashore. On Sundays, when it is time for divine service, the ship's bell is tolled and the church pennant is flown above the colors. Attendance at church services is voluntary. Navy chaplains are clergymen commissioned as officers and among them are those of every denomination and creed. 
Within a few weeks of the time he came aboard as a stranger, the new Blue Jacket has found his place in the community, knows most of the details of the ship's routine, and knows the names and duties of all his officers. And during his first weeks at sea, the new sailor has been acquiring something he has scarcely been aware of, something that makes America's seafaring men win their battles and their wars. For out of the companionship of his fellow men, out of his pride in his ship and his love of the open sea, there has been born in him an indefinable quality which is called the Navy spirit. Almost before he knows it, greenness and strangeness have worn off, and he is a full-fledged member of the ship's company, rooting hard for his own division, his own ship, and most of all, for his own Navy. Seasoned in shipboard routine and in Navy customs, the sailor has been shaken down into a new way of life entirely different from anything he has known before. A way of life which will forever leave its imprint on him. As long as he lives, his meals will be chow, his coffee java or jamoke. Steak and eggs will remind him of the 3 a.m. battle breakfast purposely hearty because no one knows when galley fires can be lighted again. Always he will think of a kitchen as a galley. Stairs will be ladders, walls will be bulkheads, and until eternity the floor will be a deck. Though in time of war, ships of the Navy must spend the fewest possible hours in port, one of their primary peacetime missions has been to show the flag in foreign harbors. At his discretion, the commanding officer may grant shore leave or liberty to men whose services can be spared. Before you are permitted to leave the ship, you will be required to be in proper uniform and to present a neat and tidy appearance. You will be expected to maintain this appearance while you are on shore. When you go ashore wearing the uniform of the United States Navy, you are not a private citizen. You are looked upon as a representative of the United States, and whatever you do ashore will reflect credit or discredit upon your Navy and your country. While you are on liberty, stay on your good behavior and keep out of trouble. Avoid drinking too much. Apart from the damage excessive drinking may do to you, it brings disrespect to the uniform. Make it a rule not to talk shop when away from your ship. Blue Jackets and Marines are frequently made the target of enemy agents, seeking to obtain information concerning ship movements. For the protection and safety of yourself, your shipmates, and your country, great care and caution should be exercised in guarding your conversation with civilians ashore. Today, your Navy is engaged in the greatest struggle it has ever faced, a war which is truly a war of survival. Your shipmates are now in combat with the enemy in the North and South Atlantic, in the Arctic, in the Mediterranean, and in the North and South Pacific. They are supporting American troops in South America, Greenland, Iceland, the British Isles, the Near East, the Far East, the continent of Australia, and on many islands of the Pacific. <laughs> Ships of the Navy are carrying, and must continue to carry, bombs, planes, and ammunition through perilous waters to American pilots and gunners who are in actual combat over all the continents of the world. On all the oceans, the Navy is at battle stations. Behind the Navy's fighting spirit is a tradition that has carried it to victory in every war it has fought. A tradition voiced in the long-remembered words of the great John Paul Jones. I have not yet begun to fight. By the Navy's great Oliver Hazard Perry, we have met the enemy and they are ours. And in the men of the Navy today, its officers, its Blue Jackets and its Marines, the Navy spirit and its traditions still live.
district dedicated to every man in the United States Navy, from the newest recruit to the old boy, the Admiral himself. All hands on deck. Since the days of our first great naval hero, John Paul Jones, that command has brought the men of the United States Navy topside on the double run. Ever alert, ever willing, ever heeding the call of duty. These guardians of the deep are a bulwark on the far horizon, America's first line of defense. But before a lad's a sailor man and fit and able to tell a binnacle from a bosun, he's quite a lot to learn. The Naval Training Station for recruits at San Diego. Here, new recruits arrive every day. Young men from cities, towns, and farms, from every part of America. These boys over 18 years of age and citizens of the United States are entering a new life, their first day at the training school. All hands, all the truck, and fall in. Hey, hey, look, hey, look. Yeah, it must be boat drill. No, no, not what I mean. The water. Is that the, is that the Pacific Ocean? Well, it's not the Atlantic. Yeah, it's San Diego, but it couldn't be the Mississippi, could it? Gosh. All right, fellas, pick up your gear and follow me. Now, as soon as I get my uniform on, I'm going down there and take a close look at that ocean. You mean to say you never saw an ocean before? <laughs> no, I never saw any water to speak of. <laughs> well, we had a mud hole, but the cattle one, but it dried up. Uh, my name's Potter. I'm from Kansas. Mine's Benson. All right. You stick close to me, Kansas. I can show you plenty about boats. Yeah, I used to say I'm an old man's yacht lots of times. I've been around boats most of my life. Worked on a coal barge on the Erie and shipped out of Boston on a tanker. <laughs> I even sold peanuts on a ferry boat, working my way through high school. No kidding. Yeah. All for one thing, Navy. Thousands of recruits building strong bodies. During the first few weeks, young men often gain from 8 to 10 pounds. Exercise and healthy appetites contribute to each man's fitness for the job ahead. So the old boy put me in dry dock, practically scuttled, you might say. He didn't put a dust like that, did he, Bill? Well, it's the same thing. Just think. Me, Bill Jennings, the best chief petty officer that ever upped an anchor, flat on my beam ends. A landlubber. It's disgraceful. Look, Bill, the same old story. We've been over it a hundred times. Whenever you get in port and find out you have to stay a while, you consider it a personal insult. Well, that's why I've said no every time you've been around long enough to ask me. A girl doesn't want a husband who's two jumps ahead of a flying fish. Joanne! Joanne, don't shove off in the storm. Joanne, darling, I... Right shoulder! Hands! Right! Two! Three! Four! Get those chins up! Head! Head up! Eyes to the front! Left shoulder! Hands! Right! Two! Three! Four! What do you think you're doing, Kansas? Pitching hay! Why not? Hands! Right! Two! Three! Four! Five! Rest! The boys need a little rest. First few days are the hardest. Hey, 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 you sailor, on your feet. I said rest, not fall out. Look, there's not going to be much more of this drilling, is there? I mean, after all, I thought in the Navy... You'll be surprised, Benson, to find out how much training is necessary before you're sailor enough to go aboard one of them battle wagons. Good old ocean. Set my course by the evening star. Whistle me a breeze from a land afar. Whistle you what? A breeze. I got that out of a book. Pretty, isn't it? What is it? Poetry. Oh. You know what I'm going to do as soon as I get through drilling? This sailor is going down and take a good look at that old ocean. Excuse me, Mr. Shakespeare, but let me put you straight. Don't call yourself a sailor just because you got that new rigging on. And if it's water you're craving, well, we'll take care of that right away. What? Well, maybe is that enough ocean for you? Yes, sir. Cheer up, Kansas. As soon as you're through training, you can send you close to the laundry. Well, Murad, you seem to know so much about Navy regulations. Maybe you can tell us the proper manner for addressing an officer. 
Direct to address an officer less than the rank of commander as mister. Sailors not required to salute when in the... Or at recreation, indoors or out. Of course, uh, he should salute whenever addressed by an officer. That's right. Uh, of course, the chief petty officer doesn't rate a salute at any time. <clears throat> uh, hurry up and get those clothes washed and get them on the line. All right, how much do I need to close my and the speed of the engines. The wheel with which the ship is steered. A compass which indicates the course and direction of the vessel. Not only do the enlisted men learn the business of being a sailor, but each man in the Navy can select a surprising number of other trades and crafts. Typewriting and secretarial work. Photography classes are popular. Boxing instructions are every sailor's opportunity. If you would be a machinist, an electrician, a cabinet baker, the choice is yours. Radio and signal instruction is given by an expert. Earnest young men see in the modern United States Navy an opportunity to equip themselves for a real career. You know, I wonder if these fellows that ask the questions can answer them. Oh, wait a minute. What's the matter? Oh, here it is. I have to bring this book back to the library. You've been doing an awful lot of reading lately, haven't you? Learn a lot about the Navy from some of the books they've got over there. Mm-hmm. The scenery's not so hard to take either. There, that's what I've heard. Howdy, oh. fellas. Hi, Hi. 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 Say, this is the first afternoon I've had off so far. You know what I'm going to do? <laughs> good out of that good, good old old. Yeah, and I'm going to get me a rowboat, and I'm going to row all Attention. over that. Where's your hat? Oh, well, I guess I must have lost it, sir. You're out of uniform. Report to your company commander. Yes, sir. Carry on. Yes, sir. Find him right over there, I think. Maybe you'll think you have the robo kit. <laughs> Got a match, Chief? No. Hello, Mr. Jerry. Oh, hi. hi. See you in the squad room, Dan. Yeah. You're a fast reader, aren't you? Oh, yeah. I, I'd like to take out that book on signals and semaphore. Wouldn't be too much trouble. All right. You're going to know more than the Admiral if you keep this up. Oh, yeah. Don't you ever take an afternoon off? Oh, there it is, the green one. Where? On the top shelf, the green one. Oh, yeah. Hello? Want something, a book perhaps? Huh? Yeah. Uh, no. Oh. Oh, Bill, that was sweet of you. Oh, just a little trick I picked up in the raffle. Knowing how silly women are, I brought it to you. Oh, no, I... Well, Dan, I see you got your book. Too bad some other people I know aren't more... Oh, no, this isn't the one. Here, I'll get it for you. The green one, see? Can't you tell a green book from a red one? <laughs> Here, let me have that. Hey, where are you going? Get on the here. What's the idea of getting in here? Get out of here. You people go ahead with your work. Hey, 
most wonderful news in the world. Look here. What, look what, here. What, what, that we can all go deep sea fishing. Isn't that wonderful? Here, let me read it to you. Let me, let me read that note. Let me, look here. Look here. And listen, man, who is to take advantage of the deep sea fishing trips now available? Must register the names with, with the recreation officer. Isn't that wonderful, fellas? Isn't that wonderful? Listen, it isn't like going out in a battle wagon, but it's getting the old ocean under you, isn't it? Good old ocean. Yeah. 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 Join the Navy too. See, isn't that North Island over there? Yep. That's North Island Naval Base, where little squabs of tender wings start sprouting their pin feathers and finish with wings of steel. Well, hey, fellas, look. Look at the battleships. <laughs> Battleship? <laughs> That's destroyers. The little buggies that defend the battle wagons in time of combat. Isn't that a submarine over there? What it is? And that's a fine branch of the service, too. There's extra pay for that. This over here is the city of San Diego. That's where the boys play over the weekend. Uh-huh. Hey, Benson, this is your speed. You think you can handle it? That's for me. <laughs> well, boys, you better be getting ready. We're nearing the fishing ground. Hey! I got a bike! Hold his head up! Hi! <laughs> he got away. Yeah, he took your line with him, too. You'll find some more leaders and hooks in my kit there. Okay. Which one? The blue one. Hey, where's Kansas? If I haven't seen him, you don't suppose he fell overboard, do you? Huh? Oh, maybe step forward. I'll have a look. What's the matter, lad? Does it get you? Training station, San Diego, California, 20 August, 1940. Subject, training crews. One, two weeks from the present date, recruit company 55, 56, and 57 will embark on a training cruise. Destination, Hawaii. Signed, Henry C. Gearing, Captain United States Navy, commanding. Company commanders, take charge and dismiss your companies. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's gonna be fine for you, lad. <laughs> I bet I won't get sick this time. Not on a real battle wagon, I won't. Did you hear that, Joanne? Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, and the moon shining down on Diamond Head. <laughs> You're not weakening, are you, Bill? Huh? Oh, no, I'm gonna stay here like I promised. This cruise wouldn't mean any more to me than eight bells to a mackerel. Bill, if I were a Navy man, I guess I'd hate to be in dry dock, too. <laughs> no wonder those boys are happy. I was talking to Dan yesterday. Oh, so young Howell's been around for more books, has he? I suppose you helped him pick him out, too. Now listen to me, Bill Jennings. You're going to be jealous of every... Well, I think Dan's one of the nicest boys at the base. And I'll tell you one thing. He's old Navy. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. It's only that I've had the lad on my mind so much lately. And I'm just now convinced it's my duty to speak about him to the captain. Bill, you're not going to do anything to hurt that boy. That's just what I am going to do, darling. I'm going to suggest to the captain that Seaman Howell does not belong in the Navy. 
The long-awaited moment is at hand. The young seamen assemble their equipment for a final inspection before they board ship for their first trip at sea as Blue Jackets of Uncle Sam's Navy. No blade in your razor. Two mistakes. Where's Dan? Medical officer sent for him. Medical Sure hope it ain't measles. Time like this. Yeah. Fold wrong and folded wrong. Two mistakes. Don't you know how to fold those yet, lad? No, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Can you read the numbers on this color chart? No, sir, I can't. Right, Mr. Jennings, this lad is totally colorblind. That's a tough break, lad. It's no reason. But you know yourself you can't have fair sense your sound on ship shape. What would you do if you were watching the signal flags for the Admiral? The blue flag went aloft, meaning all clear. And you thought it was a red flag, meaning rapid fire. It'd be pretty much of a mistake, wouldn't it? I've been to scandalize the whole fleet. What I can't understand is how you managed to get in the Navy in the first place. All right. Memorize the color chart before I enlisted. Can you blame a guy for doing it? All I ever wanted was the Navy. Their last parade before boarding ship. As they march on the field, each man is happy that his preliminary training ashore is over. In a few short hours, only the far horizon will mark his new home afloat. Jauntily, they swing along, breathing deeply of the fresh salt air that blows across the parade ground. In its breeze, a promise of billowy waves and the white churn trail left behind. The last one, matey. No more parades. Step smartly now. Talking to the captain again. You're going on that cruise, Danny. He's going to make an exception in your case because of your fine record since you've been here. Well, what about the eyes? Time to think of that when you get back. And me, the best chief petty officer that ever upped an anchor, I'm going to see to it personally that there's a place in the Navy for as sully and steadfast a lad as yourself. Oh, thanks, Mr. Jennings. Well, never mind that now. Get your seat back and your hammock ready for transfer. You're shoving off right after. <laughs> Cut out! <laughs> I'm glad the lad made the ship. So am I, Bill. I know how he's feeling, too. He and the other boys. You know, it's a great thrill you get when you board ship for the first time. The deck rolling smooth and easy under your feet is solid and sound. Somehow it comes to you that it's more than just steel and timber. It's part of the nation. Yes, sir? When you're afloat, no matter what hemisphere, longitude and latitude don't seem to figure into it. It's part of your country, that deck. And then one night when you're standing watch out there all alone, under the blue sky with the bright stars shining down on you, you get to thinking of all those that have stood watch before you, under that blue ensign with its white stars, like the night. On down the line, as long as there have been American ships afloat, those decks have heard the steady footsteps of those who love and serve the sea. But their country, first of all. So to the American Blue Jackets, fair sailing always as they carry the honor and tradition of a mighty navy over the waters of the world.
stations on duty in Berlin are the mobile outposts of the American presence here. The wall is their beat. They travel as close to it as they can, keeping it always under surveillance and keeping the forward areas of the enemy's part of the city beyond the wall under continuing observation. 